Thanks for mentioning that. I always wanted to put that on my CV, but uh, it's good to get it out there. Uh, so I'd like to thank Prescott and all the others who put on this wonderful event. Uh, it's getting near the end now, and uh, I feel like I've really learned a lot about dogs in this, in this uh, uh, three days. Um, uh, as uh, Julie said, um, although I've worked with dogs in shelters and I've done that now for many years, um, I really uh, am more of a basic researcher, and our laboratory mostly looks at basic research questions, usually with laboratory rodents, and we're interested in the effects of stress and how stress can influence the development of disorders like depression. Um, but the, what's frustrating about uh, uh, basic research is that it's so slow paced that even if you come up with a great finding, you're unlikely to ever see it put into practical application. So one thing I really enjoy about the dog work is it's a chance that we can take what we and so many other people have learned in the lab, go out into the real world and apply it, and that is to apply it to, to uh, dogs in, in animal shelters. Um, I, I know we, we've all heard a lot of uh, background today, but uh, I think a little background is still called for. I will try to um, uh, not be too repetitive and to complement what the other speakers have talked about as well, but I think it's always important to be on the, the same page. And one of the problems with stress research is just that there's so many things that people consider stressful, and we have to think about ways that we can sort of unify that, we can classify them so we can think about them in a more consistent way. So if we think about the kinds of things that might stress us, there are a number of kind of minor things that we run into, if not every day, commonly. So we might have a job interview. And not everybody would consider this stressful, but most people would. Probably most people, would, maybe all people, would consider being stuck in traffic stressful. Okay, but these are relatively minor. You know, serious stressors are things like death in a family, okay, or, or being diagnosed with a life-threatening disease. And then there, there are other things that are more physical conditions, like a broken leg or starvation. And these things are stressful too, okay? But, but they're stressful because of this condition. The first four are a little different. They're not stressful because of what's happening. They're stressful in terms of how we perceive what might be happening, okay? So these are really what can be considered, as we heard earlier, psychological stressors. Okay? And, and one thing that um, investigators, basic la uh, investigators in stress have really focused on is trying to come up with sort of the underlying components. That is, what makes this whole variety of individual things we run into on a daily basis, what makes them stressful? And that's where we come up with these components of stress. Like uncertainty. People talked about lack of predictability earlier today. It's a, sim a similar sort of thing. When the world is uncertain or unpredictable, that can be stressful for us and certainly stressful for an animal in a natural environment. We also heard about loss of control. Loss of control is a, a very uh, important one and one that can uh, uh, you know, severely uh, elevate stress responsive systems. Um, also social separation. Separation from a close social companion can be stressful. Novelty. So novelty at, in, in small levels is something that we find generally enjoyable. People seek out novelty. But if the whole world is novel, if everything around you is novel, then it's an unpredictable, uncertain place, and it's likely to be dangerous. And, and we see this in, in animals, laboratory animals and animals in the wild, that novelty can be a, a strong stressor. And then just threat, clear, obvious threat, the predator coming towards you. Okay? But all these things are kind of the components that underlie some of these psychological uh, stressors. So in terms of the stress responses, we've heard a lot about this as well. But you know, when we're exposed to a stressor, our heart can race. We can get that uh, um, uh, increase or decrease variability in heart rate. We can uh, breath get shallower. We sweat, all these kinds of things. This is all a, a component of activation of the sympathetic nervous system and release of adrenaline in our, into our bloodstream. And the second main stress responsive system is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. But then there's all kinds of other things that happen too. There's very site specific changes in the brain that we've heard about uh, uh, earlier today. Uh, there's behavioral changes. And then there's just you know, a number of other things that will happen in one particular type of stressor, but maybe not in response to another type of stressor. But if we're talking about the psychological stressors of the sort that I mentioned, then the uh, HBA system, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal system, is really the one that is most sensitive to these on a, on a general basis. Okay? 
Um, again, we heard about this again, but I'm going to go through it very quickly. Uh, hypothalamus, small area in there, the paraventricular nucleus, will release the first hormone in a three-hormone cascade. It's corticotrophic releasing hormone. This is CRF instead of CRH because some people call it corticotrophic releasing factor. It's the same thing. It goes a very short distance in a very localized circulatory system to the anterior pituitary. You release ACTH. That gets into the bloodstream. It reaches the adrenal glands above the kidneys causes the outer portion of the uh, adrenals, the adrenal cortex, to start pumping out glucocorticoids, a powerful steroid. The, the primary glucocorticoid for us and for dogs, once again, is cortisol, okay? Now, this happens all the time. This doesn't happen just when we're stressed. We're always having some level of this being put out. But when we're stressed, then everything kicks into high gear. So suddenly, we get a whole much more CRF being pumped out, more ACTH in the circulation, and then the cortisol levels go up, okay? Another as, uh, uh, important aspect about the system is the negative feedback we heard about. So when the system gets high, the cortisol feeds back uh, areas of the brain, including the hippocampus, also in the pituitary, and it tends to inhibit further secretion. So once the stressor is over, the system is meant to then shut everything down, so it comes back down to that resting level, okay? So all of that would seem to make cortisol a very good um, uh, measure. Oops. Okay. <laughs> it would seem to make cortisol a very good uh, measure of stress. You know, it's, it's uh, response to psychological stressors. It's actually something that's relatively easy to assay. Uh, there's one real advantage in it in a practical sense, and that is if you're taking a blood sample, it takes about four minutes for, the st for a stress to be reflected in the cortisol that you're going to collect. What that means is if your blood sampling procedure is at all perceived as stressful by the animal, that you have four minutes to get that blood sample before it shows up in, in the, the cortisol that you've, in blood that you've collected. And so it's very practical in that way. And it's a way that many people who don't do physiological work can incorporate some physiological measure into their work. And I think it's an excellent measure, but it's far from a perfect measure. And so I just want to focus on that a little bit because I think this is really critical. First of all, not all stressors readily elevate cortisol levels, okay? Um, I said psychological stressors are particularly effective, but physical stressors, not necessarily so. In the early days, in like the 1960s, when you could first really measure the glucocorticoids in a really sensitive way, investigators wanted to see how much stress, you know, how the system responded. So what kind of stressor could you apply and what kind of cortisol response or glucocorticoid response would you get? And so they would take rats, they would put them into this novel compartment, and then they would expose them to electric shock. And what they found was that the uh, exposure to the, the box itself, the novelty, produced an elevation in the glucocorticoids. And nothing but the strongest uh, uh, intensities of shock put, produced any further increase above what the, the, the shock box, the novelty of the shock box did by itself. So in that case, the, the response that we might attribute to the, to, the physio to the physical stressor was really due to the psychological components associated with the physical stressor. Another point uh, is that, and we've heard this in, in several talks now, cortisol can increase without being what we think of as a stressful event. We have the circadian rhythm. It's higher in the morning than it is later at night. We heard that sex can increase cortisol levels. Exercise can increase cortisol levels. So you have to be careful, you have to have complementary measures, you have to somehow reinforce what you're seeing with the cortisol to be totally confident. And then finally we have this issue that the system can be dysregulated with prolonged exposure to stressors. So the system is really made to, for brief exposure. You know, that, that predator coming comes and you know, you're either eaten or you get away and, and then things come back down to normal. But when you're exposed to stressors over a long period of time, it's not what the system is built for. And the system then starts in some ways kind of breaking down because it's trying to compensate for this prolonged exposure to uh, the, the stress hormones. So under these conditions, for instance, the pituitary may become less sensitive to the CRH that's, that's being secreted. And Dr. Bearden mentioned that in one of his studies. The adrenal cortex may become less sensitive to the ACTH. Okay, both of these would mean that the cortisol levels that you're measuring are gonna be lower, okay? You can also affect the negative feedback. 
the negative feedback can become more intense, therefore levels are gonna be lower, and sometimes it, it gets weaker, all right? And it's hard to predict if this is gonna happen or if it does happen, exactly what's going to happen, okay? So, so all of these things have to be taken into account. So I think probably the way to think of it, at least the way I think of it, is that cortisol is a good measure of relatively short-term stressors, okay? So you don't have to worry about the dysregulation particularly psychological stressors, and only when other factors affecting HPA activity are, are uh, controlled. Um, you know, you can't take a blood sample from one animal in the morning and another animal in the afternoon and think you're going to, to be able to measure the effect of stress because you're not controlling for the circadian rhythm. And beyond that, it's not a good idea to take a blood sample from one animal, look at the levels, and then just, just pronounce that animal stressed or not stressed because there are these other things that can affect it. There are the individual differences that we talked about, the oscillations that Dr. Orkney talked about, you know, a pulsatile release. You can get these little pulses of release that might be happening in one animal at one point in time. But if you take 10 or 15 animals, you can kind of average those things out, and then you can draw conclusions from the differences in the two averages of those two groups. Okay, so enough of, of the background. I said that, um, you know, basically I do basic research. Many years ago, I worked in a non-human primate lab, and one of the big findings that came out of this, this is a mother and an infant squirrel monkey, and was that these, in, these close social partners, like the mother and the infant, can buffer each other's stress response. Okay, and just as a simple example from some uh, work of some colleagues of mine, um, if the infant is placed into a new cage, a novel cage, there is a big increase in the glucocorticoid response, but only if the infant's placed in alone. If it's placed in with the mother, there's no elevation whatsoever. So the mother's buffering the response uh, uh, of the infant to the novel environment. So anyhow, when I first came to Wright State, I was invited to give a talk down the road at Ohio State. And I was talking about all this monkey stuff. And at the end of the talk, uh, this guy was sitting in the front row, and he raised his hand, and he said, do you think this will work with dogs? And I said, I don't know. It seems like it should. And so anyhow, we got to know each other, and we ended up doing the experiment. Um, this guy is, is David Tuber. Um, we heard about him yesterday in uh, Steve's talk. Um, he published a paper in 1974 that uh, he was first author on. It was considered one of the sort of launching pads of the idea of behavior therapy for dogs. And he was you know, very committed to dogs, in some ways very much ahead of his time. And he had a, a dog lab at Ohio State. Now, the image that you may be conjuring up in your mind of a dog lab is, is probably not correct. This was more like he had 12 pet dogs and they happened to live in kennels because he showed them lots of social interact, gave them lots of social interaction, and as you can see from this picture, they responded to him as though he were the owner. So we did an experiment, and we had five conditions in this experiment. In the first condition, we had just a control, a handling control. So these animals got the same handling in terms of being put on the leash and everything else that all the other animals in the other conditions did. Then we had an alone home. So these dogs were, were um, uh, uh, housed with a long standing, it was actually, it was a litter mate. They lived with that litter mate essentially their whole life. And one of the litter mates was taken away. And, and then we measured the cortisol levels in the one that were left, so the alone home. The one that was gone, we would walk down the stairs to a novel cage on another floor and expose it to the novel cage. That was the alone novel. We had the dog novel condition in which both dogs were placed into the novel environment. And then we had the person novel. And the person novel is shown here. So this was David in the cage. So David sat quietly in the corner. If the dog came up to him, he pet it very quietly twice and then he put his hands back down. Unfortunately for Dave, we had done a pilot study to see how long we should do these tests. And it had suggested that probably the best interval was four hours. So poor David had to sit for four hours in this uncomfortable position for each of the eight dogs that were in the experiment. So I think that attests to his determination, his dedication to this kind of work. But anyhow, these were the results we, we saw. And uh, so, you know, we've been seeing these kinds of graphs. So the height of the bar is the average level of the glucocorticoids, and the vertical line is a standard error just to measure the variability within that group. And if you look at the alone novel, you can see that placing the dog in the novel environment alone produced a significant increase in the glucocorticoid levels. If we look at dog novel, dog novel, statistically, the, different, the levels were no different than they were if the dog was placed in the loam. 
the, the companion dog, the long-standing companion dog, did not buffer the glucocorticoid response. But if they went in with David, then the response was greatly reduced. There was a significant stress buffering. So we got stress buffering, but it was kind of a trans-species stress buffering. Uh, it was always David's intent that if we got positive results with this study, we would go and apply it in an animal shelter. So he drove me out one day to introduce me to the director of the animal shelter serving Dayton, Ohio. And she was very enthusiastic about the possibility of doing this work as, as the staff and op, you know, uh, members of this uh, facility have always been. And so we decided to do it. On the way home, David had a coughing fit. It turned out he, was, he had cancer. He was diagnosed shortly thereafter, and about five months later, he tragically died. And uh, that could have been the end of the study. Uh, uh, I didn't know enough about dogs at that point to go ahead and do it myself. Um, but he had trained a number of people, and they were very dedicated, and they were interested in, in carrying on, and so that's what we did. So the first time I was ever behind the scenes in a dog shelter was when I went with David. And, and you know, the first thing that strikes you when you walk in is the noise. Yeah, and then there's a quiet period, and then, <laughs> you know, and, and you can imagine, you've got 50 or 75 dogs in a big room. I mean, this, this just the cacophony of noise. And, and beyond that, if we look at all the things we just talked about, the uncertainty, the loss of control, social separation, novelty, exposure to threat. I mean, for a dog in a shelter, this is what it's exposed to. And even a well-run shelter can't avoid exposing the dogs to these kinds of stressors. So this is you know, exactly the kind of situation where we would expect glucocorticoid levels to be high. Um, nobody had really done this before. So first thing we did was we just got a bunch of supplies, went to the dog shelter, and started taking blood samples. Right? And then when we took blood samples, we noted how long each dog had been in the shelter. And these were the results we saw. So the first three days, levels appeared to be quite high. Um, after that, levels were lower. If the dogs had been in for a long term, they, had been, they were quite low. So what can we suggest from this, these data? Well, it looks like, first of all, there's a protracted response. Three days is a long time for an elevation of glucocorticoids. The reduction afterwards may be that the dog's adjusting to the shelter. It may be that there, there's a dysregulation in the system. We really don't know. Okay? But it's not the best experimental design. I think it was a reasonable way to get started. But the problem is, is that because we just went in and took these random dogs, it may be that dogs that are in the shelter their third day may be a from a different population of dogs than the dogs you see overall on the first day. And so to see if we saw the same pattern, if we, you know, in, in the, across for the, the same dog, we took a blood sample of dogs on day one, and then we came back on day four or five, the dog was still in the shelter, we took a second sample. And we saw a pattern like we saw the first time. So it appeared that that really was the, the type of, of trajectory of the cortisol response that we saw in the shelter. So how do these compare to pet dogs? Well, we had some friends who allowed us to take some blood samples from their pet dogs. And what you can see is if you compare the levels to the dogs the first day in their shelter, the, the levels in the shelter are a great deal higher than, than the pet dogs. Okay? Now, you know, for this audience, I think everybody would, would, you know, is concerned about this, but many people will say, you know, who cares? I mean, it's, it's three days, you know, they're going to adjust, you know, they'll probably get adopted. Um, but, you know, I think there's lots of reasons to be concerned about this. And, you know, the most obvious one is the welfare. If, if the cortisol is up, you know, these dogs aren't enjoying their time there, so it'd be nice to, to increase their welfare by reducing their stress level as reflected in their cortisol levels. But beyond this, you have to worry about long-term effects on behavior. You can have stage, uh, 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 cage stereotypies all right, that develop after long-term exposure. Um, it's thought that uh, being in a kennel too long can increase separation anxiety. You might increase other objectionable behaviors. And all those things can impact adoption. And you know, adoption is the goal line for these dogs in, in the shelter. I mean, the, a successful adoption is, is what you want. And then beyond that, there's just basic you know, health effects that you have to worry about. You know, we heard about the interaction to glucocorticoids in the immune system. So when glucocorticoids are up for a prolonged period of time, they suppress adaptive immunity, one component of the immune system. They also have effects on innate immunity. They can suppress inflammation, but in some cases they can also increase inflammation. 
um, a, a student, um, actually a veterinarian, uh, Emily Dudley, who came back and did a master's thesis in her lab recently, looked at just white blood cell counts in dogs in a shelter. And what she found was that you know, total leukocytes, neutrophils, lymphocytes, all these were elevated on the first day. The, the black box are, are the pet dogs at home. And we see dogs then that are in day one, day three, or day 10 in the shelter. The levels are up, and they tend to go higher. To some extent, this might have been influenced by uh, infection, but it didn't appear to be the case. It looked like it really was the stress. And so you, you, can, you can muck with the immune system in lots of ways. And when the immune system is imbalanced, then we're vulnerable to lots of different kinds of issues. So I think there's lots of reasons to try to reduce these levels. So we did. We tried to reduce the levels. We did a simple experiment, took a blood sample, then we put the dog either back in the cage, the control group, or we petted the dog for 20 minutes. And then at the end of that 20 minute period, we took a second blood sample. The idea being, maybe we could reduce the response. If the first blood sample was producing a response, we would see with the second one, remember, because it takes four minutes for, for the response to, to appear, so taking a blood sample here will only show up here. Maybe we could reduce the response to the shelter, and if we were really lucky, or I'm sorry, maybe we could reduce the response to the additional stressor, the blood sampling procedure. And if we were really lucky, maybe we could also reduce the response to the shelter itself. Well, we were disappointed when we got the results. So the open circles are the control animals, and the closed circles are the experimentals. And the first thing you can see is the lines are different right from the very beginning. And this is before we even put them into the conditions. And, and this is, we see lots of variability in cortisol levels when animals first come into the shelter. And this is you know, something we see over and over again. But the worst part about this is that there's no apparent effect of petting. The lines are parallel. Uh, we you know, examined our data closely to see if there was something in there, and we noticed that there actually was a difference depending on who petted the dogs. So if you look at men petting a dog versus women petting a dog, the, the women did a lot better. Okay? The, for the men, there actually was a significant increase from the first time to the second time in the dogs that were petted. Right? And for the women, there was not this increase. So, you know, why do we have this, this difference? Why might uh, uh, s uh, sex of the petter matter? Uh, you know, it might be something just intrinsically different between males and females. Maybe their odor. People suggested the odor associated with what testosterone does may uh, be something that is threatening. All right? But what we thought was more likely was that the males and the females were just petting differently. Um, I mean, one thing you could tell was that the women were all talking this soft kind of baby talk, you know, that you, you wouldn't hear the guys doing. Uh, and, and beyond that, though, if, you know, the, the, the women that we had in the sample were not a random sample. Most of them were some of the dog trainers that David had trained. And they tended to use a particular procedure with these dogs called, this is something that David developed, called the soft procedure where it's basically a deep muscle massage. You go very slowly. You repeat the key word like soft, to indicate to the dog this is something special. All right? and, and we thought this was probably the key. So we uh, took the guys to another shelter. We trained them to pet like girls. When everybody agreed, they were petting like the girls. And we went back to the first shelter, and we did the study again. Okay, and this is what we found now. So in the open circles, you can see that the control animals that returned to the cage for 20 minutes, again, showed the cortisol response. But if they were petted by a male or a female, there was a significant reduction in the glucocorticoid response. If anything, the males did better, but this, that difference between the males and the females was not statistically significant. But you'll also notice that we weren't able to reduce the cortisol response below the initial level. Okay, So we were reducing the response to the additional stressor, but not to the shelter baseline, which was already high. All right? And we thought maybe that was because we did this initial first sample that kind of got in the way. So we did a second study where we just pulled dogs out and either took a blood sample or we petted them for 20 minutes and took a blood sample. But that didn't work either. If you look at the means, the juvenile adult dogs, the control and the pets were 29, 28 um, uh, uh, micrograms uh, or nanograms per mil. Uh, the puppies, uh, puppies tend to have lower levels, were about 13, okay, and there was no difference between them. Okay? So, I, you know, the, the conclusion here was a specific form of human interaction could reduce the, in the shelter, could reduce the cortisol response to this additional stressor, the vein of puncture. 
Uh, another opportunity to look at human interaction came in a study that was supported by the IMS company. IMS was, was interested in whether their diet could affect the behavior of dogs, and whether diet could affect the behavior of dogs, and uh, we were interested in whether human interaction could affect uh, the behavior and the glucocorticoids. And so uh, we did a study. They wanted eight weeks. It took about eight weeks they anticipated for the diet to have an effect. And so we planned a human interaction procedure that would also take, take, take eight weeks. And we had four groups. Uh, if we go to the diet first, we had uh, one, uh, two groups that had the minimally acceptable diet, met the minimal nutritional requirements, but nothing more. And then we had uh, two groups that got uh, what you would call premium dog food uh, that has more protein, more digestible stuff, more, um, uh, I forget all the others, but a better diet, you know, the more expensive ones in the store. And, and um, uh, then we also had the human interaction manipulation. We called this the living room because we tried to fix up a room so it was like a comfortable room at home. Uh, the shelter had just remodeled. Unfortunately, the only room they had available for us was the old men's bathroom. But uh, we moved in and we kind of fixed it up. We put down a carpet. We put a rug over that. We had a, a, um, uh, a desk and a chair and a, a lamp with soft light. And we brought the dog in there for 20 minutes, um, five days a week, uh, uh, over the course of this eight-week period. Okay? And then uh, and I'm, I'm going to focus on the human interaction effects. Okay. Um, first of all, the, the response to the diet, uh, or the response to the, the shelter was not affected. This graph is divided up by diet A and diet B, but we see the same thing with human interaction. Basically, it's the pattern that I showed you in the very beginning. Levels are high initially, they tend to go down, and the uh, human interaction or the diet had no effect on the glucocorticoid levels. Right? But we did a different or additional test in this experiment as well. We, what we called the novel room. And, and what this was is there was a, uh, an old wooden garage on the shelter property. And so we had carpenters come in and make essentially a giant open field inside this, this garage, a big box. And then we led the dog, we took a blood sample in the shelter, led the dog out there um, entirely new, put the dog in the novel environment. And it was, we made, went of our way to make it extra novel. So we had a stranger walk quietly around for a minute. Then we had an air horn go off. Then we had a toy car come and run for 30 seconds around the dog. All right? and, and then we looked at the glucocorticoid response to that. And, and these are the results we found here. All right? Now this graph's uh, arranged a little differently. If we look over on the left, we can see the dogs that were in the living room, the ones that were not. But what we're looking at is the increase from the pretest to the post-test. So in other words, the, the, if we look at the, the comparison of what happened after they were in the novel room to before they were in the novel room, it was about 200%, or in other words, it doubled. So the, the, we saw a good, healthy stress response. At the end of the eight weeks, the dogs who had not received the supplemental human interaction showed a much greater cortisol response relative to base. Right? And the dogs that had received the human interaction did not show that additional elevation. So in this study, we found for a second time that we could reduce the response to an additional stressor. But what was new about this was now we could do the human interaction at time A and reduce the response to the stressor at time B. Another uh, interesting opportunity came up was what we referred to as the prison study. Um, the Humane Society in Dayton had this innovative program going on with uh, a medium security prison in town where they would take the very best sort of the, you know, the model inmates and as a reward they would get to foster a dog for three weeks. And the intent was to provide socialization for those dogs to see if it would improve their behavior. And anecdotally, it seemed to be working. And so basically, we just went in and did kind of a, a, a program evaluation of this in some sense. So the dogs either had three weeks of socialization at the prison or they remained at the shelter. And then we measured the behavior and the uh, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal activity both before and after the three weeks. Um, I haven't said much about behavior, I haven't said anything about behavior, but uh, the human interaction did have, does have some positive effects on behavior. Um, these were measurements taken uh, with a stranger present, but right after the dog had experienced the moving car. And what you see is that in the pretest, before any of these dogs were in the experiment, that there was some, the ones that ended up going to the prison tended to jump on the person a little more, but that went down, whereas for the control, 
uh, uh, the, the dogs that remained in the humane society, jumping tended to increase. And that pattern was statistically significant. We see a similar sort of thing for barking and whining, the vocalization measure. It tended to go up for the control and down for the dogs who were socialized in the prison. Right? And then we had yawning. Uh, yawning actually increased more for the dogs in the control group. As we heard from Dr. Beard's talk, uh, uh, yawning can mean different things, but it can be a conflict behavior. We like to think it was the dog deciding whether to bark or not and deciding not to and just yawning instead, but we don't know. Um, but when we looked at the glucocorticoids, we saw, again, no effect on confinement. Um, you can see we measured ACTH as well as cortisol in the study. And if anything, they tended to go up. And I think this has to do with the dysregulation. I'd be happy to talk about this later uh, if, if somebody is interested. So I think you're probably seeing a pattern developing here. You know, we were unable to reduce the response to the shelter itself. And in addition to the four published studies I've just gone over, we had four additional ones where we couldn't find the effect. And to just make our frustration higher, the group from Colorado State had um, uh, come out with some positive findings. They had found that 30 to 90 minutes of interaction on day two had actually reduced the cortisol response on day three. And so we were trying very hard to figure out what was going on. And at some point, we started thinking about our concept of a novel room for these dogs. You know, we're always concerned about exposing them to novelty, because you expose them to novelty, and they're going to be more stressed. And that was certainly true in the IME study, because there, you know, we went out of our way to make it super novel. You know, we had the dog or the, the car running around. We had the air horn blowing and, and so forth. But, you know, if you think about a dog in a shelter, and especially in the, one of these rooms in the, with the, all the dogs in it and all the barking and all the commotion, and if you take a dog to a quiet room and someplace else in the shelter, maybe that's a much better place. You know, it's not going to be any more novel for the dog, and it's probably going to be less stressful in other ways. So we started stopped talking about novel rooms and started talking about secluded rooms. And then we did a study to look at that effect. So the design of the study was we had two control groups. We had a group that had a blood sample taken and was returned to the home cage. We had one that was isolated in the secluded room. And then we had three conditions in which the dogs received human interaction in that secluded room. Um, they either got the, the, the kind of soft kind of petting technique, or we actively played with them throwing a ball and so forth, or a stranger a woman just sat in the corner and, and essentially ignored the dog uh, during the whole time. And, uh, and, this, oh, and then we took a blood sample, did the treatment, took a second blood sample, and looked at the difference. And these are the results from that study. So the two open symbols are the two control groups. So you can see returning the dogs to, to the home kennel or even isolating them in the quiet secluded room did not produce any reduction in the glucocorticoid response. But any form of human interaction significantly reduced the response for these dogs if they were in the secluded room. The response seems to be, the slope of the line is a little steeper for the, for the petting, so we still suspect it might be a little better. But you know, these were not statistically different. So just having somebody sit in the room was sufficient to reduce the levels in, in this study. So at this point, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to learn more about this effect, and we're trying to come up with ways to make it more practical. You know, if our goal is to be able to have volunteers come in and reduce the physiological response of the dog, we want to make it as practical as, as possible. And my graduate student, Regina, uh, uh, Regina Willen, who's going to be talking later uh, today, um, uh, has been uh, spearheading this work, and so I'm really talking about her studies here. But, you know, one thing that, that might be useful is, you know, 30 minutes is, is, is shorter than an hour or so, but, you know, it's still a pretty long time. So Regina looked at whether 15 minutes would be as effective as 30 minutes. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot a, a conclusion slide. So now we were able to reduce this response to the additional stressor at the same time, a different time, and to the shelter itself. And the one other thing I want to say about this is, in addition to us finding it and the Colorado State group finding it, but at the same time we were doing this, a group in Spain found it too. So it really seems like it's a robust effect and, and a real effect and something we can work with. Anyhow, so will 15 minutes reduce the stress response? Um, here, if the line goes down, if the bar goes down, it indicates a reduction from pre-test to post-test. And you can see that 30 minutes of petting significantly reduced the cortisol response again, but 15 minutes of petting also did. And there was, even though the 30 minutes seems a little bigger of a response, there was no significant difference in the amount that the levels were reduced. 
That was the good news. The bad news was it was, it was a transitory effect. So if we looked at the dogs uh, an hour later, after they've been returned to the, the commotion of the, of the, of the uh, main room, that um, the levels came back to where they were. Another question we're interested in as, is, you know, can you do this more than once? Um, you know, we showed that you could reduce the response in dogs when you pet them one time, but what happens if you pet them the next day? Will it still work? Well, Regina did that study, and as you can see, it does work. So whether on day one or day two, we see the reduction as indicated by the drop in the bar below the horizontal line, both for day one in the black and for day two in the blue. Right. And since then, in, in, well, there's another study going on at the same time. Um, uh, in Emily Dudley's study, she looked at petting seven days, I believe it was, over a 10-day period, and she still saw the response on the 10th day. So we think it is something that can be robustly repeated. Um, one other thing that, that Regina noted while she was working there was that, you know, most of the dogs we, we work with are strays. But there are some dogs that are released by their owners for one reason or another, and she thought they were responding a little bit differently. And there's work that already shows that if you look at that you know, trajectory of the cortisol response, that is different for dogs who are released by their owners than for dogs who are uh, strays. It tends to stay up a little, the levels tend to stay up a little higher. So she uh, uh, or, uh, established groups of dogs that were relinquished by their owner and those that were strays and tried to see if petting would reduce the, the levels to the two of them to the same degree. And this is what she found. For the strays, again, she got a nice robust response, a very significant effect. This was 30 minutes of petting. For the owner relinquished, it was in the right direction, but it was a much smaller decline and it was not statistically significant. So it looks like the dogs are differentially responsive to this petting procedure, at least the first day and at least you know, one time of petting. Um, and, but all this, again, kind of refocuses on, on not what the dogs are doing in the shelter, but what happens to the dogs before they get to the shelter. You know, I told you that we are always dealing with lots of variability on the first day. We always see more variability in the beginning than we do at the end. And, and you know, we don't know what these dogs have been going through, and it's probably a huge variety of things. And so how can we get some glimmer of, of uh, idea of what's going on? Well, and I, a, a technique that's been catching on is to measure cortisol, not just in blood or feces or urine, but also in hair because it gets deposited in hair, and as the hair grows, you get, in a sense, at least a, a, a crude, cumulative record of the stress that the animal has been under. And so um, Regina uh, looked at the hair of these same dogs, uh, uh, a, half a half a centimeter was it, but it was enough for the equivalent of two weeks. And, and you know, our thought at this time was, you know, maybe the dogs who are relinquished by their owner are used to this happy home, and then they get somebody other than their attachment figure, and it's not working. And so we were kind of surprised when we saw these results, that if you looked at the, the strays and the owner relinquished, there was no statistical difference between them, but if anything, you know, the owner relinquished are, are higher. And, and so, you know, these, I think, raise some, some um, many questions and things that we really would like to look at uh, in the future. Um, you know, I, I, there, I suppose there's a negative side of this, and maybe there's a positive side. And that is if we can begin to, in some way, categorize dogs coming into the shelter in some way, maybe we can kind of personalize the kinds of treatments that they get once they're in the shelter environment. So in any event, the, the kind of takeaways from this are that um, uh, cortisol is a good measure, uh, but it can only measure so much. Uh, brief interaction is an effective way to reduce the cortisol response. Um, it depends on, on where you do it, though. Um, if you do it in a quiet room or maybe outside, but something away from the harshness of the main kennel environment, it seems to be a, a key ingredient. Um, the effects, at least in our hands, are, are temporary, and I think that's something that we need to work on more and, and other people as well. Um, the source of the dog is important, and maybe the upside of that is that uh, it may be possible to individualize treatments so that we can further improve or specialize in how we reduce these levels. And I would like to end with the same finding that we've heard so other people talk about, but I think it's so germane. Um, you know, so here's the finding. This was published in Science in April. Um, uh, the dog, your dog, gazes into your eyes. Okay, it doesn't work with wolves. The, the dog gazes into your eyes. You have a release of oxytocin. Okay, your release of oxytocin then seems to encourage you to interact with the dog. 
your interacting with the dog causes the dog to release oxytocin. If you give oxytocin to a dog, simulating what would happen when he gets an increase, presumably, the dog shows more gazing at you, which does what? Releases more oxytocin. It's a positive feedback loop. It's the kind of thing that you'd really expect to see between something like a mother and an infant squirrel monkey than between members of two different species. You know, and so I think you know, the, the, uh, uh, Jim Hall talked yesterday about uh, the sort of inner intermingling of our evolutions, the co-evolution of, of dogs and, and humans. And, and if we think of it in those terms, you know, in the way that our social signals may be able to have affect the physiology of the dog and vice versa, you know, maybe we shouldn't be powerful effect on the physiology of, of dogs. So I'll end there. I want to thank um, you know, so many colleagues who have been so uh, instrumental in this work. The Montgomery County Animal Resource Center, who has just been incredibly supportive, numerous students, way too numerous to name, and funding from uh, the Waltham Foundation, the Scott uh, Charitable Trust, the Iams Foundation, and as a broader impact from the National Science Foundation. So thank you. <laughs>